want to welcome you all to another weekly science exchange uh, with UWA. We're here to promote the relevance of our UWA research and its teaching activities to you all. My name is Kirsty Brooks. For those of you who have been here before, I've always been in the background and I'm making my on-air premiere today. Um, thank you to everyone who has been involved already and I look forward to hosting today's session for you. I'm actually a lab manager here within the Faculty of Science at UWA, so I'm usually aiding the learning of our students. But today I've decided to moderate uh, some of our great researchers so we can uh, learn a few things together. So it is almost time to start, but before we do, I'll give you a bit of background about each of our researchers, a small bio on each of them and introduce them all to you for those of you who aren't familiar with them. We've got Associate Professor Fran Hoyle. So Fran's actually um, had a research career that spanned almost 30 years. And she's included, uh, that, that's actually included time in Perth, Durham and Northern. In a number of appointments that have uh, gone across national, state and industry committees. She's got growing interest in organic management, soil quality and function, uh, which inspired her to actually do a PhD in soil microbial processes related to carbon turnover, which I dare say we'll probably hear a bit, a bit about today. Friends came to UWA in late 2015, and she's actually the current Associate Dean for Community Engagement here at in Science. She's the Soils West Director and continues to have research interest in soil carbon and farming systems. Next, we've got Dr. Nick Taylor. So Nick uh, came back to, do I say came back to Western Australia in 2000, Nick? Were you here before that? Nope. Okay, so he moved here in 2000 to complete his PhD. Um, and then he went over to the UK, but then he came back to sunny old Perth uh, as he was attracted by the large and advanced agricultural industry and opportunities for him to carry out his research. Nick focuses on identifying changes in the cellular chemistry of plant cells when they're exposed to changes in their environment, with particular focus on maintaining yield during extreme temperature events. Uh, he hopes that this knowledge can contribute to the development of more environmentally friendly and adaptable crops um, to maintain and enhance future production. And last but definitely not least, we are pleased to invite Dr. Don McFarlane in with us as well. Don has observed climate and agricultural changes um, here in WA since the 1950s, as well as across Australia. He grew up in the wheat, on a wheat belt farm before studying soil science and hydrology. Uh, Don carried out this research in natural resource management areas for the Department of Ag and water, and also for CSIRO. Don's currently an adjunct with the uh, UWA School of Agriculture and Environment. All right, with everybody's introductions um, done, I guess I'm gonna kick off the conversation. And I wanted to start with Don, as I think that you actually have some insight that none of us have, and that's lived experience as well as the research uh, on how you've seen the climate change here in WA. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit so we can get this started? Yeah, yeah okay, Kirsty. I, I have been around for a long time. And as I say, I grew up in the wheat belt. And certainly my memories of what the climate was like have very, very changed as to what they were, what they are at the moment. And I guess as well as observing them over a long period of time, I've also been able to do a lot of measurements of them so we can actually get recorded estimates of what's happened. And certainly, I mean, when I first started with the Department of Agriculture, um, we were work, working on problems of too much water. You know, so there was water erosion, water logging, dry land salinity, there was all sorts of things, that, but it was mainly too much water. And, uh, and so we were looking at ways of, of preventing a lot of land degradation that was occurring at the time. And uh, when you think about it now, um, a lot of those issues are not front of mind for a lot of farmers. And, um, you just have to remember back, well, I do anyway, remember back to the fact that um, the, the uh, we know we had a lot of flooding problems um, and people were putting in contour banks. They were going to the, to the Department of Agriculture for things like contour banks, which are just anathema at the moment with, with farming systems. But the whole, whole uh, Southwest used to get very, very wet. You know, we would get um, days on end of, of rain where everything would wet up. The soil profile would wet to very great depths. Uh, but now we've, um, just at the moment, we've, we're getting very light showers. And uh, what happens is that it, it only wets the top of the soil. Uh, in between those showers, we get a lot of uh, sunlight comes out, the wind blows, everything dries off. And um, the worries we had in the past about things like water logging, as I said, have just disappeared because the wetting fronts are not going very deep anymore. So we had a lot of issues to do with what to do with the water in the, in the subsoil and how to get the roots down into the subsoil. Well, if the, if the water 
doesn't even penetrate the, the subsoil in some years, then it's very, very difficult to actually get uh, access to the nutrients and the other things that might grow in those subsoils. So I guess what I'm trying to do is paint a bit of a picture of how we've gone from you know, too much water to now we're only wetting the top subsoils. And perhaps later on in the, in the discussion, we can talk a bit about what the projections are for the next 30 years, because one of my roles in the last uh, 15 or so years has been to look at water supplies. And uh, we've done a lot of uh, climate projections as to what's happening uh, and likely to happen in the next 30, to, next 15 to, to 30 years. So I guess uh, just in that, um, I'd just like to throw it open with, with Francis and Nick as well, apparently, and just say, well, if we're only wetting the top 15 to 20, 30 centimetres in some years, uh, is that all of the, the profile that the, the plants can see? Yes, so thanks, Don. I think that's a really great segue in. And, and you're really right. I think having seen the rainfall distributions change over the last decade, and particularly, you know, that lower rainfall, the ice are high, it's moving toward the west and sort of getting drier and, and warmer and, and perhaps seeing the frequency and um, distribution of rainfall change it's been really critical to think about where the plant roots are in a soil and what that soil can hold. So in terms of the soil um, strategies, you know, we are looking at, you know, largely farming in systems where perhaps we've got some constraints um, within the soil's profile. So whether they be a subsoil compaction layer, a soil acidity, low fertility because of low organic matter, um, you know, we are really looking to see what we can do and how we can engineer our soils, potentially, and our biota and our plants to see how they can better capture that water faster, more effectively, but also get deeper into the profile so that we can, we can finish off through the season. I think one of the other interesting things I've heard talking to um, some growers, particularly down south of WA, is that not only is the amount of water that's um, arriving, the time of year that it's coming is changing a lot too. Um, and I was talking to um, a grower just north of Esperance and I was saying that they're getting quite a lot of summer rain, which was very much not a part of WA 10 years ago. Um, so they're getting a little bit less rainfall, but it's coming at a totally different time. Um, and that's having to make them think about how they're going to change their planting profiles. Um, and the time in which they want to sow and the time in which they want to harvest. And one of the more extreme examples of this is you've got some growers um, and a bit, bit further north that have been planting winter wheats in March um, and then putting the sheep on them later on to get some of the biomass through uh, because they've got that moisture so much earlier than what they used to uh, from the summer rains and then um, harvesting, you know, September, November time again. So as well as just the amount of water when it's coming, is also going to dictate you know, when we should be planting and, and what results we get from those plantings. And that is yeah. really critical in terms of the soil's function as well. So if you think about it, the longer that a soil is under a plant system or a planted system, the more resources it's getting back in terms of you know, root exudates, organic matter inputs. Um, so the more biologically active and functional it can be. So, you know, having those opportunities to extend the length of a growing period or to supplement it with a, a different type of system would seem advantageous in terms of benefiting the fertility of the soil as a whole. I think perhaps the other thing I should mention that one of the, the great advantages we've got now compared to when I first started researching is that we've got so much better at predicting what's going to happen in a season. I, mean, I know it's still very crude and people would say it's not accurate enough, but if you if you you know you have the history that I have, it was very very difficult to know what sort of season you're going to get, and um, I'm very impressed by having worked with groups in CSIRO and, and the Bureau of Meteorology as to how quickly we're now able to get a much better idea of what sort of um, next going to happen in the next five to ten days, but also what's likely to happen over the season. Um, the, you know the really importance of sea surface temperature and comparing this year's with previous years. But it's take, taking a lot of the guesswork out that was there years ago, and I just see this is going to continue in, in future. You know, the ability to make last minute decisions in some cases by farmers as to how much crop to put in, when to put it in, you know, whether to add fertilizer, all those other decisions which were done by the seat of the pants years ago are now being done with some very, very powerful computer uh, models that weren't, weren't available previously. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I do agree. I think, though, there is, you know, that there's still that really strong need to look at the opportunistic um, timeliness of what we might do in terms of responses to things that perhaps aren't, are a bit more unusual or a bit less predicted in terms of, you know, are there opportunities to put in a, a cover crop over summer mm -hmm. in the right environment opportunistically? Um, but also not just that, not just the effect on the plant growth, but, you know, if, for example, we had increasing summer rainfall, which we've mentioned, and we had increasing temperatures over summer, then that also has an effect on the, the decomposition rates of the soil organic matter in the soils and when those nutrients are flowing through that system. So with higher temperatures and moisture conditions, we'd expect soil organic matter to decompose faster so we need something there to be able to, you know, how do we utilise those nutrients that are produced from that? And with these op opportunistic plantings, you know, depending on what the season is like, um, are we going away from the more standardised yearly rotations that we've seen that, that have existed in WA for a very long time that um, don't vary so much over the last 10 years? To something that's going to be much more opportunistic where people are choosing based on what the weather predictions are, based on where, what the soil nutrient state is, um, and based on all those things rather than their traditional cropping rotations. Mm. And, and I'd add in markets, I mean, we've just had an example this year where people were getting around to putting in, you know, manufacturing barley and, and making decisions at the last minute is what's happening to, to markets as well. So, and I think the other thing that we've traditionally not done, getting back to the some rainfall thing, but if you've been to Queensland, they look at how much moisture there is in the soil and then they make a de cropping decision on how much moisture there is. So if we do get some northwest cloud bands bringing some moisture down and we get some subsoil moisture, then we can suddenly make decisions about what to do in that year. And I've also seen in places like in Western New South Wales where they might make, make a decision not to crop, crop at all in some years. You know, they just think that there's no soil moisture there. Uh, all the projections are that it's not going to get be a wet year and therefore why should we put all that capital in, into, a, into a crop or at least put it into a very short um, you know, uh, growing season crop and also to avoid the frost issues and things like that. So I must admit being a farm at the moment is much more complicated than the farm that I grew up in where yeah. you know, it was very traditional and you knew, you, you knew a year in advance what you're going to put in into each, each um, paddock. And you just pad it. You just cropped it um, fence line to fence line as well. Yeah, and I do agree. I mean, that's a there's a key difference in terms of thinking about the systems and and how they change. You know, between soil types, for example. So if we took those Queensland soils, which are nice and deep, and they have quite a lot of water holding capacity, and compared them to maybe some of our shallower sands or duplex soils, where potentially we've got a lower ability to store that water for a longer period of time, then we're facing a different set of challenges. So you know, what is it about our our plant structure or its rooting function or our soils, because we're talking about can they get below, you know, if there's stored water below, can they get to it? If there's a subsoil yes. acidity layer, then they're not going to potentially grow through that. So it's, I mean, it's such a complex system. It's really exciting, but it just means that there's lots of things to unpick as we move through it. And I think that there's lots of opportunities, Nick, with um, plant types that potentially have, um, you know, that have rooting systems that provide us that capacity to get deeper or to produce different root exudates that perhaps do something for us. What's going on in that space? Yeah, there's some, there's some really interesting research, um, particularly in the, res, the abiotic stress responses. Um, and a paper that I know you'll love and I'll send to you later on was one that came out just recently talking about the microbiome and how the microbiome was inf um, affecting the salinity tolerance of some wheat varieties. And so, I mean, salinity is still a problem in parts of the w WA and particularly down south where they have the higher levels of rainfall. I know they're still dealing with salinity issues there and they often use cover crops as a way to try and uh, ameliorate that, that salinity. But at the same time, there's some um, interesting observations that have happened with farmers around the place, which are saying that now, historically in WA, it was 100% you know, about the yield. They wanted the highest yielding variety they could possibly get. But now that some people are considering um, a change from that perspective, which is they'd rather have stable yield over a number of years that might have a small yield penalty because it's a stable variety, a more reliable variety, but that would be, they'd be happier to deal with that than the boom and bust years that we've traditionally seen. So and maybe so, given those plant types that have 
um, are more efficient at utilising the resources that are available to them. Yeah, or that are more resilient to the, you know, the, the wide changes in temperature that you might see or the wide, um, more adaptable to a bit of salinity environment, but there's a yield penalty to that. So the, the really good areas of the farm, if it's a really good year, they're not going to do quite as well if they had the ultimate crop in there, but they'll, they'll flatten out the curve, so to speak, over a number of years. And if you look at some of the production, you know, compare Australia to many other countries, um, the biggest variable that affects um, the production of grains in Australia is the climate. Year on year, we have these huge fluctuations. It's much more stable in Europe, and it's much more stable in America and South America, but the climate really has a huge impact on the production levels here. Now, it's I mean, interesting I... because um, we used to have a very reliable winter rainfall here, and, you know, we, you could be pretty sure when you'd be cropping and, you know, when you'd be able to have pasture for sheep and all sorts of things. But, and we've talked about that seasonal shift, and the, the most obvious one is that the late break. It's just been amazing. I mean, it's been at least, it seems like six to eight weeks, from my memory, of what it was like when I was growing up in that wheat belt farm. Um, but the, the, the end of the season hasn't changed as much as the start of that season. Uh, and as I say, we can get some of that summer rain. It, we've looked at the statistics on that. It is there, but it's not there in every year. And it really does depend on uh, the, you know, whether we get, as I kept mentioning, the Northwest cloud band. So that's really, really important, particularly for the eastern wheat belt, as to whether you get that or not. But that can decide whether you've got a really good crop or, or not. But can I just ask the question, because it was always the thing, can we now conserve water in the soil? Let's say that we, we're not going to try and grow a crop and use the small amount of water that's, that's stored in the soil profile. What's our ability now to actually be able to carry over water from one season to the next? Is that, is that improved in that time? So, so I think in terms of the soils research, you know, there's been a lot of work done that's been done through the Department of Primary Industries, funded through GRDC, the universities, CSRO. Um, you know, I think we've been doing really well at re-engineering soils and providing access or pathways into deeper soils, which allows us some capability of utilising that deeper moisture. I think we're hamstrung a little bit, you know, with the fact that we do have very sandy surface topsoils um, and we have low organic matter. Now, I know a lot of people talk about organic matter and its ability to hold water, and it does. It's tremendous in terms of its capacity to hold water. But you have to think about what percentage of the soil is made up of organic matter. So most of our soils would be less than 2% organic carbon. Most of them would be less than one and a half. Um, and for every 1% of that carbon, you're probably only holding a difference between two and five millimetres. So perhaps in a season which was infrequently wet, if you had that two to five millimetres available to you a number of times, it would start to add up. You know, 20 kilograms of grain per millimetre of rain, and maybe you'll get half a tonne. But I think, you know, in a, in a year where you're getting more frequent rainfall, it's going to make very little difference at all to a water supply. It may make a difference in terms of, of nutrient turnover and things. So I think we just have to be a little bit careful in terms of pointing at one thing and saying that's our solution because I don't think it will be a one-step solution. I think it is that complexity. And this is why I love this panel is because, you know, we've got climate, we've got soils, we've got plants. Um, and I think that, you know, we really need that cross-disciplinary focus to see why this plant root is accessing what it does and what it can do with it. Can I, can I uh, put up a bit of a um, plug for sandy soils? I know that they're getting a bit of a beating here, but actually if you don't have a lot of rain in some years, then the soil requirement for that water is very low in sandy soils. If you try and wet up a clay soil to any depth, you need an enormous amount of water. And so what happens is that sandy soils allow water in because it won't run off because they're much more permeable unless they've got water repellents, of course but they allow the water in and if it, that top uh, centimeter or two dries off which it does sometimes which if you don't get another uh, event it stops soil evaporation so you actually effectively you've got this you might have a moist soil only a few centimeters below the surface but because the top few centimeters are dry it stops capillarity and it won't evaporate so it's actually very good at conserving water in some ways, having sandy soils. So I actually, I actually am a fan of our sandy soils. I think if we had all heavy clay soils, you know, we'd be very, we'd be battling to actually grow um, crops in some years. And they're much, they're much easier to organ on. 
<laughs> I, can, I can testify to that having to grow plants in the glass house. I'd much rather grow, grow them in some sandy soil than in some clay soil. <laughs> but I, I guess that does lead us not only to talking about the soil, but also what is the options for your plant um, and their adaptability to the climate. I think what we've been able to confirm here is the climate's changing, but it's variable and we can't uh, being able to anticipate what that climate's going to look like is, is difficult, but being able to identify options for our growers um, and talking about, I think the two things that I've taken out of this is, it's not just the soils, it's not just the plants, it's them working together, but also the information that we need to know how and when and why we should grow things is also quite important as well. So maybe Nick, did you want to, is, is what kind of work is being done with the plant adaptability or, or line breeding that can actually look at these kind of um, issues our growers are facing? Yeah, well, there's some really exciting research going on. Um, I guess from me, from my perspective, I started my PhD in 2000 and that was the same year we sequenced the first plant genome. Um, and just in the last couple of years, we've actually started a serious effort to start sequencing many of the genomes of our important crops. And we only got wheat just last year um, because of its complexity. Um, humans have been breeding wheat for such a long time that we've kind of messed with it and made it really complicated. Um, but at the same time, since 2000, we've started learning a lot about the genes that control a number of features in plants. Um, and this has been done on our model plant. Um, we, it's like a lab rat for the plant world. But now a lot of that knowledge can be applied to our crop plants because we have the genetic information. And so I actually see now the ability and the, the possibility of making plants that are much more water efficient um, or that are more adaptable to varying climates. I mean, most of us local gardeners would know that some plants are particularly susceptible and some aren't. We're starting to get a handle on why that is, um, and we might be able to apply those ideas into our crop plants going forward. And same with our heat tolerant plants or our humidity tolerant plants, we can apply that knowledge. And we've kind of opened up this, this, all these possibilities through the sequencing of the genome. So for me, it's kind of the most exciting time possible to be involved in agriculture because of the possibilities that are available. And I think we can start to address some of these questions in tandem with our soil friends um, about how we're going to um, manage the challenges that we're facing um, with the changing climate, but also the increase in demand. We know that by 2050, demand for food is going to increase globally. And so we're facing a sort of double challenge. We need to increase our productivity at the same time as do it in a more difficult environment. And so um, I think these genetic tools are going to provide us with the things we need to make these plants that will maintain their productivity in the harsh environments and allow us to continue to grow their production for the future feeding of and food security. Yeah, and I think what I've noticed in the um, genetic work that we've been able to do, not only across plants, but also uh, in soils as well, is it can take out some of that unknown, a bit of that trial and error that we would usually do. We can, we can put a bit more, um, concrete evidence around what we know because we're able to map what we're able to map and what was an unknown what we can't see we can now see so we can see that either through um, a numbers game down to a species level um, and understand the environments that we're dealing with because i i think the one of the statistics that blows my, or one of the numbers that blows my mind is um one of our professors Andy Whiteley here had a stat that he'd um, spout to students about the microbes in soil. And when you walk across some healthy grass, approximately how many microbes are under one foot? And it's, uh, it's, it's 12 trillion, um, which is huge. And, and I think that a lot of us have taken for granted um, the living environment that is the soil. Um, you know, it's not just the plant that's alive. We have to remember where the plant gets its food from. And we've always been told it's the sun, it's the sun, but it's not just the sun. They need the water, they need the nutrients from the soil to be able to fully grow. Um, and, and that's really interesting, Kirsty, because, you know, there is in a handful of soil, there's what, a billion microorganisms there. What's really interesting, though, is that even though there are so many, I mean, there's so many, it's hard to get your head to comprehend how many there are. But in terms of them persisting in the soil and where they're living, 
they're really a little bit like islands or hotspots of activity. So they're probably only colonising about 1% of the surface area of that soil. So, you know, there's billions and trillions and zillions of them. But what I would really like to see is, you know, how do we work with Nick, for example, to say, can we deliver a plant genotype that is going to provide root exudates that signal to the right organism that it wants to produce nitrogen now, um, or it wants to uh, enable phosphorus to be taken up into the plant. So how do we trigger the functions of the soil that we see as beneficial to a cropping system in this instance, um, through providing it different root carbohydrates or amino acids or, you know, those sorts of things. And I guess we're only just touching the surface at the moment because we have traditionally bred for what's above ground. For 120 years in Australia, we've only looked at yield and how the plants look and biomass effectively. And so we haven't really focused on root traits. And I think root traits are becoming increasingly acknowledged as an important part of the success of those plants. And the root mycorrhiza interactions are, are, are clearly becoming an important part of our understanding about the productivity of those plants. Um, I hadn't even considered that a mycorrhiza could have an effect on salinity tolerance until I was totally blown out of water by the paper I mentioned earlier. It just came out last week. And so um, our understanding of the roots and the root structure and the role they play in the success of our cropping systems is increasing and, and there's some really global and local research going on that's really exciting in that area. Nick, can I ask you uh, to think ahead? In, if, if everything is going the way you're saying and you are being able to breed for you know, drought tolerance and heat and cold and salinity and all these sorts of things, in 10 years' time, do you see farmers with silos filled with grain that's got these sort of abilities, or at least some, or another way, if you like, of modifying the soil, so that depending on the season and predictions of what's going to happen to the, to the rainfall during that season, how much soil moisture they've got, what the markets are, they could put, they could make a last minute decision as to what to put into the ground and then how to treat that, perhaps, you know, treat the soil or the, or the plant afterwards. Is that is that where you see agriculture going? Or the way, you know, because you can see the future a little bit better than certainly I can. I'm not sure. I think there certainly will be um, years where you want to make that, op you want to take that option and make the best of your particular year. And I think some farmers, like, I mean, farmers are a diverse group of people. Some of them will be conservative people and they want steady, consistent yield year in, year out. Um, and then you'll have the more risk. Uh, um, willing to take the risk farmer who might say, well, look, this year is looking like I can really make massive gains by using this variety. Let's put it in and take that punt on that variety. And when we think about mitigation strategies, um, that might be, you know, you could choose one mitigation strategy, which is the conservative route, or you could take the, the risky strategy. But also farmers are buying land in different areas so that they're managing their risk in that way. They know that this area, if that has a bad year, my other area might have a good year and my other area might be good as well. So I can see the way in which we produce bulk commodities being very different and people choosing specific um, plant types or plant varieties to suit their, um, their particular climate or their farm status at any one moment in time. But I can also see the conservative approach remaining on larger farms and in certain circumstances. So I think we'll see probably combinations of both. So perhaps one other thing that I've actually was, I've been a little bit disappointed, hasn't been taken up as much as it could have been, but you know, back in 1987, so that's what, you know, 33 years ago, we started using satellite imagery to map uh, areas of waterlogging. This was for the precursor of the Grains Research and Development Corporation or GRDC. They said, how big is waterlogging? And we went in there, we were able to map uh, with people from CSIRO, um, where all of the high yielding and low yielding areas were in, within paddocks. Now, I, and, and then obviously we then went on and mapped where the salinity was and all that, uh, lots of other things. But I would have thought that within five or 10 years of that being used, it would become quite routine for farmers to actually monitor exactly where their yields were coming from. But I still am surprised in some cases where farmers are still cropping parts of paddocks, which have, will always lose money. Their gross margins will never be positive, you know, in other areas where they're getting 80 or 90% of their, their production from. 
I know some farmers have adopted some of this new technology. It's not so much new anymore. It's 33 years old. But we can map now with pretty high precision as to where, where the farm profits are coming from. But I haven't actually seen a major take up of that technology uh, and people just saying, look, I'll only put in this quarter of this, this paddock or I'll fence this paddock out and, um, and not even try to put any fertilizer or grain or anything into that other part because I always lose money on it. Is that, is that, are, there, are there some of these technologies that just don't seem to take root? Is, is that what you've discovered elsewhere? I think there's some barriers to adopting the technology. And I think that like um, we're aware now of what some of those barriers are. And there's active work by um, organizations such as, I know the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility, for example, is trying to work and provide a data pipeline, so to speak, that um, makes it easy to interpret and assess that data um, that's coming from the satellites. Um, because it's kind of inaccessible. Um, and what we kind of really want is a decision, kind of like a decision matrix, right? So you add in a piece of data and one of those pieces of data would be the satellite information about the, the state of the particular farmer's paddock. And then your other decision matrix might be what type of grain you want to grow depending on what's happening in our markets because we can see they can change very quickly or um, how much they're prepared to invest that year in um, their fertilizers or those other things. So I think that the access, there's been some roadblocks to people being able to access that information um, and satellite information was much more expensive in 87 than it was, than it is now um, with all the various entrepreneurs putting up their satellite clusters into the space. Um, but at the same time, I've been waiting for a hoverboard and I still haven't got that. So um, <laughs> yeah. uh, some of these technologies that are there, they show a lot of promise early on, but the deploying of them is, is complex. And I think um, there is work being done nationally in trying to make that data more accessible. There's a lot of people that, that see there's a lot of data out there and we've got to get it together to make the best farming decisions so that we can have the most productive outcomes. No, no, I, I think you're spot on there. I think that in some ways there needs to be a middleman to take this information and put it into a format where people can properly interpret it. To expect farmers to go and do that is just, just unbelievable, you know, not feasible. But the other bit of technology that came out in 1987, which we were using when we were doing the board logging mapping, was global positioning systems. Now, GPS is now just everyone uses GPS all the time. But the satellite uh, monitoring and mapping that we were doing, you know, 33 years ago is... It's there in some places, and, but there's still no middle person, if you like, providing that service. And I'm just surprised that in some ways that it's not as developed as GPS is in terms of decision making, because as you say, all that data now is much higher precision uh, and it's actually free. Uh, and it's all calibrated and it's available. In some ways, there's almost too much information. And I know Graincast is, is being used by G, uh, uh, CSIRO and others. So that may be one way where we can, we can use that data a bit more easily. I, th I think there's also um, lots of future potential there. You know, there's lots of more digital agriculture type learning and content now based in the undergrad degrees. Um, so I think in terms of going forward, I think you're right. I think it's been really difficult to find the platforms that match together in terms of integrating the information and being able to pull a decision out of it. Um, they've been little isolated um, bunches of data. I think there's more and more consultants in this space. Um, and I think it is a true future area for agriculture going forward um, is in, you know, designing the platforms and the systems and, you know, working with the scientists to make sure they have the evidence base around how those decisions then come out of those platforms. Yeah, and there's a lot of work being done here at UWA in that, and I think it's purely that. It's finding the right ways to communicate it to the public yeah. for them to also be able to use it um, and make it worthwhile. So uh, we're actually launching um, a new degree in ag technology, looking at precision ag and how that can benefit. So we should have a nice new generation of um, precision ag students coming through in the next few years that have been, um, now that, I think that we feel that we've got the capabilities and the, our own knowledge is a lot more concrete, um, especially with the advancements of drones. And we can even throw back to one of the previous science exchanges with Nick Callow and how, much, how quickly he spoke about that changing in that field and how much that's um, now become accessible. 
that a lot of people want to use it. So now we just have to figure out how can we use it um, and how best do we communicate it to the public and our growers to be able to utilise that. I think that point you made, Kirsty, about um, data supported decisions um, is really important and the, yeah. the value of making sure that we're making decisions based on the data. Um, I can put up a drone and take a photograph of something and then infer something from it, but I need a, a basis for making those decisions and those calls. Um, and we need to ensure that the data that's been and the decisions that farmers have been making are from um, well trusted repositories of information um, and based on scientific evidence. Yeah, and I think that's coming back to us as scientists, knowing that, you know, we can rely on our memory, but sometimes our memory can play tricks on us, how quickly and how slowly things happen. Um, but if we have that as concrete evidence and we can go back to that, that definitely helps us with those decisions. And um, I can speak from experience, knowing how patchy climate data can actually be um, going back multiple decades um, and that we want to be making these decisions informed and we don't want to be we want to be learning from anything that we've done in the past and not repeating anything i mean a really good example in the current system is probably the controlled traffic systems you know um, where you're starting to employ the data layers the precision technology that's available to you and it has benefit in terms of soils because you're only trafficking a small area of a larger paddock um, which obviously has benefits for root growth water storage you know all those sorts of things so I think we are getting there. It's just sometimes stitching the story together takes a little bit of time. Um, yeah, I guess let's jump into some questions because I'm aware of time and we're yep. probably running out of it and we might not be able to get to too many guys. Apologies, okay. we got a bit carried away. Um, let's, uh, let's start with Ian because his question's been sitting there for a while and we've probably answered it to some degree. But in the scenario where growing season rain over the southwest continues to decline, um, how long can we continue our rain-fed rain annual crops? Do we think that there's a use-by date? Will we run out of adaptations? I guess the first question is, is that decline in rainfall going to continue? Um, because we don't know what's around the corner. The predictions are that it will continue to decline. Um, and um, I guess there is a, I mean, there's a limit on how much water um, there's a minimum limit of how much water is required to grow a plant for our current varieties. So we start to think about water use efficiency. Um, can we grow plants that have um, uh, a lower water requirement? Yes, we can look at many examples of different types of plants that grow around the world in environments that have a lot less water. Do we understand entirely how they do it? Not yet, but with some of the tools we've got, we might start to understand that. and We might be able to apply some of those techniques that those plants have developed over their evolutionary time to deal with the low amounts of water in the environments that they live in. So um, I think there's a possibility that, yeah, we would be able to, there, there is a limit. Um, and I'll flick over to Frances because I think she's going to talk about it. <laughs> well, there's this panel discussion. Um, so, so, you know, again, going back to what we've seen, what we know. So, you know, we know that in a large majority of our growing areas, we haven't actually reached our water limited yield potential as yet. So there's still a lot of rain, effective rainfall that we're not currently using. So, you know, if you think about the last decade, I think we've had about a 10% decline in the amount of annual rainfall that's fallen, but we've not actually lost any of our production because it's been with sufficient frequency at a time where we're still able to maintain those yields. So there's a little bit of squeeze value, I guess, in there in terms of where we're decreasing rainfall. If it's at the wrong time of the year, then yes, there's an impact there. But can we be more effective in getting our water into the soil? So getting over our water repellency issues, ensuring there's good infiltration, there's better storage capacity, and then have the matching plant type that sucks it up more efficiently. Cohesive I mean, science. Yeah. <laughs> Make a comment on the you know the future projections. I mean, because we've been involved when I was particularly when I was with CSRO, we did a lot of work on looking at future projections. But we'll also be able to go back and look at what the old uh, future climate, uh, climate models were saying too. And I do have to say that unfortunately, of the sixteen climate models we looked at when we were looking at the yield of all of the rivers and, uh, and aquifers in the southwest of WA all of them were saying it's going to get hotter and drier and i think hotter is is no one's arguing it's going to get cooler or very few people are 
it's just a matter of whether it's going to get wetter. But every, just about every model, there was, there was one model that said it would just stay the same. But I mean, every other model was saying it was going to get drier. Now it's been another, it's been 10 years since we looked at that data and it's actually been tracking, not on the median of what projections were, it's actually tracking between the median and the dry. So that if, if anything, the models have been under predicting how fast our climate is, is changing. So those people are hoping that this is just a short term blip and it's going to be a cycle and we're going to go back to wetter and everything will be fine. I won't need to change my farming systems. That's not what the, the, the climate is saying. No. And I'll just have to say, if you go back to early, even earlier, the Bureau of Meteorology did some projections in the uh, about 2006 or 2008, I think, and they're, they're actually been pretty well spot on as to how dry and how much hotter it's going to it's, um, it's got. So, so uh, yeah, I think we need to plan for an even more variable and hotter and, and possibly drier climate. So I'm glad to hear that there's still some unutilised moisture out there. We don't need to give up just yet, Fran. <laughs> All right, I think we're, I can lump a few um, questions together into one nice little term. Mm -hmm. regenerative, regenerative agriculture, I can't even say it. Regenerative, regenerative agriculture. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so I guess that falls under, so Sam asked the question, is there a possibility for emergence of carbon sequestration to improve our soil through organic matter and that uh, water content held? Which also leads into Chelsea's question about carbon cropping to tackle climate change as being a popular, just popular action that we're doing, or is there actual concrete evidence that this is going to help us? So soils are considered obviously one of the largest pools to sequester carbon. Um, it's larger than the terrestrial uh, carbon pools. Soil carbon in terms of building it up and sit, storing it in a permanent way is really challenging. So for two reasons, more than two reasons actually, but soil carbon is essentially driven by two things. So climate, again, and soil type are two of the dominant factors. So soil type is influential because in our sandy soils, um, there's very little to physically or chemically complex that organic matter so that it's protected from decomposition. So it decomposes really, really fast. Um, so it's a matter in those systems of maintaining enough inputs every year or regularly to ensure that it's either maintained or built up. And that is really challenging. So if I thought about changes in soil organic carbon associated with a change in farm management practice such as adopting no tillage um, and stubble retention. You know, I could say we have studies that have shown after 28 years with no burning that our carbon contents are very similar to the, to the trial plots where we have burnt stubbles. And that is not necessarily reflective of, of its function. So the ones where we've retained stubble are more biologically functioning. So they supply more nitrogen, but they haven't stored more carbon because of the limitations of the plant inputs. We also know that rainfall and temperature influence carbon storage. So I've said earlier, increasing temperature and increasing amounts of available moisture will enhance the rate of decomposition. So it'll be going faster. It's not necessarily a bad thing if you're in a cropping system, because as it's turning over, it's obviously supplying nutrients as it goes. What it doesn't do is enable you to stabilise carbon in soils very rapidly. So we did a study where we looked at measurements across 1,500 sites across WA. We looked at the driving factors, including climate, soil type, management practices by growers, fertilisers, you name it, we looked at it. And it pretty much said sort of north of Perth um, and sort of 50 kilometres in from the coast, there's a very limited potential to store new carbon in those environments, particularly the drier environments, because A, you're not getting enough rainfall to produce plant biomass, which is then going to recover that organic matter in your system. But you're also getting hot summer moisture events. So it's breaking down really quickly. So lots of the potential for WA is seen to be in that south southwest corner. Lots of the perennial systems have lots of advantages in terms of carbon storage. What we know very little about is the permanence of that carbon. And in a carbon trading system, that is key. 
Um, so most of the carbon that we change in soils will be the labile, so the very quickly turning over carbon. It won't be the carbon that maintains in the soil for decades. So yes, we can change carbon, but it's a decadal process. It's not something that's gonna happen really quickly. Um, and so yes, you can enter into it with a caveat that it's going to be a frequent fly point perhaps versus a decision why you'd put in place the system. Um, but it wouldn't be the reason why I chose to engage a system. You know, you might be looking for a more resilient system to cope that would still give you a yield, for example, rather than just looking at carbon trading as the sole output of those systems. All right, well, I think we all knew that we were going to open Pandora's box a little with um, this conversation, but it's been fantastic. And I apologize to those that we haven't got um, around to your questions, but I will be passing them on to our speakers to be able to answer. But before we sign off, I did want to um, ask each of our speakers to today to um, maybe leave us with any of our take home messages from today's larger conversation. If you have anything that you wanted to maybe leave as a pondering thought or any, anything to surmise what we've actually been able to achieve today. I'm gonna start with you, Nick. I guess um, you know, it, it's a challenging environment, um, a challenging environment to grow crops, um, but agriculture has faced many challenges in the past. And particularly for the people that are a bit younger, um, go and look up something called the Green Revolution. And that was a period of time in the 1950s and 60s where we faced some really big challenges in agriculture and through great funding and um, of research and great work by many scientists around the globe, um, the challenges at that time were overcome. And I think we're hopefully at the beginning of something that might be looked back in the future as the second Green Revolution. Um, so it's an exciting time to be in agriculture um, and um, I hope to see lots of really keen students turning up at my door in the next few weeks. Thanks Nick. What about yourself, Don? Well, I think the words that really stuck, stuck with me, uh, Kirsty, are opportunistic and flexibility. Um, those are the things that I think, you know, we, 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 you might have a long-term strategy, but I think the short-term tactics are going to be very, very important and to have the flexibility to, to, uh, to uh, make the most. I think the other thing is that I'm really excited by the, the sort of tools that are available. You know, and I keep coming back to satellites and things like that. But if we could map um, soil moisture, you know, biomass, um, all those sorts of things and, and where the yields are coming from uh, using satellites and other things, but also the predictive power of the, the computing power at the moment of, of what's going to happen with what's going to happen, you know, with our ability to predict seasons, I think is, is the other exciting thing. So. I don't know whether we'll ever be able to accept, you know, predict markets with the same precision, hopefully, but the biophysical world, I think we've got the ability with computers and that to, to actually take a lot of the guesswork out. I think it'd be very exciting to be a farmer if you're into that sort of thing, um, and perhaps working with your consultants in that area, it would, could be a very, very exciting time to be a farmer. Yeah, and I think it's not just being the farmer, but being all those, those people that um, satellite around anybody that's a grower to help them achieve these. And, really look at not only the macro climate, but the micro climates is the most important for any farmer will tell you in this room is what's happening on my front door isn't what's happening down on the front door down the road. So um, understanding that is definitely something that I see happening um, around campus and we go, when we go out into the field and do trial sites and stuff like that is trying to um, facilitate that kind of action as well. And Fran, I'll, um, I'll let you leave our last few words. Thanks, Kirsty. So, so I think I go away with thinking about, you know, regenerating our agricultural systems and our soils. I think we've been doing this stepwise for a long, long time. You know, if you think about all of the strategies we've implemented that have been a change in agronomy or soils management. So liming paddocks, no-till, um, appropriate varieties for the appropriate land type. So I think our growers have shown lots of stewardship over our agricultural systems. And I think that they continue to be the leader and the forefront of our changing farming systems. And, you know, we need to work with them more and we need to work with each other more in terms of making sure that we get these integrated complex systems. And it is exciting because I think agriculture is a really strong career choice still going forward. I see a bright future for agriculture and you know, I've been here for 30 years and I hope to be here for a few more. Um, we hope everyone in this room are going to be 
working together because um, I know and our audience probably isn't aware but none of you guys have really worked together before so I hope this is an introduction to some great things and also to the people in the room. Um, we thank everybody that was involved in today, not only our speakers but also you guys on the other side of this virtual wall. Thanks everybody, thank you guys. Thank have you. Have a great night, stay safe and we'll see you bye. next time. Bye. Okay, bye.